Apostle Paul, he is an excited individual. And what excites him? The fact that he sees individuals living out their faith in obedience to the truth of God. So let me ask you, if Paul were to look at your life, study your behavior, to pay attention to your works, your deeds, would your life excite him? Would he be pleased that that message that he taught, that he took to the nations, that message is alive and functioning mightily in your life? Or would he be confused? why it's not producing what it should. Well, we are in the midst of our study of the epistle to the Colossians, and Paul is indeed excited about this congregation. And why is that? Well, take out your Bible, look with me, Colossians chapter 1, and now we're ready for, for verse 9. Notice what he says here, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 9. He writes, on account of this, also we, on account of what? That they are in the Spirit. They are functioning and living out God's order in their life. Paul's heard a testimony. How do I know that? He tells us in this verse, on account of this, also we, from the day that we have heard, we have not ceased in behalf of you praying. Now, this is the second time. Paul uses a unique word order, a unique grammatical construction. Instead of putting the verb that he's praying and others are praying with him for this congregation, it says, for you, concerning you, in your behalf. It's all words to emphasize, make this emphatic, that he is praying for this congregation. And not just praying, he gets more specific. He says, and asking in order that, that you might be full of knowledge. And what knowledge that he wants them to have? Some uh, uh, Einstein book knowledge, intellectual superiority, understanding all these types of technology and things that, that smart people understand? No. And none of that's bad. But notice what he's speaking about. He wants them to be made complete, to be full, is a word that's used here. In the knowledge of what? The knowledge of His will. Let me ask you a question. When was the last time, seriously, that you prayed diligently, God, reveal to me your will. Tell me this day what you want me to do. How I can serve you, what it is that I can do being led by your spirit to honor you, to bring glory to you, to live a life that is praiseworthy. See, if you're not praying that you would know God's will, let me tell you, you are not serious about your faith. So often people are caught up in their life. We're going to find because of redemption, it's no longer our life. Later on, we'll come to a section within this epistle to the Colossians that speaks about our life properly, how we should understand our life. And is it really our life anymore? But notice here, Paul is praying for them that they might have knowledge of his will, that is not Paul's will, but the will of God. In all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Here again, wisdom, a heavenly wisdom, a godly wisdom, and a spiritual understanding that they see things. How? From a spiritual perspective. So when you are in a situation, when you are called to make some type of decisions, and we constantly, I mean one after another after another, we make decisions. Are you making them from a spiritual perspective? I was reading an article about a young woman who is in the entertainment industry, very, very famous, very uh, successful, very wealthy. And she was talking about uh, her contract as it uh, was many, many years ago when she gets started. And she feels like she was taken advantage of. She did not get good counsel. She made poor decisions. Let me share with you something. Whenever we are left to ourselves, regardless of what area, whether it's business, 
whether it's personal relationship, who we're going to marry, whether it's raising children, whether it's buying a house, whatever it might be. If we make them based upon a human standpoint, let me tell you, it is going to be always, always, always the wrong decision. We need to always make a decision, no matter what area of our life it connects to. We need to make it from a spiritual point of view. And that is only possible when we have spiritual understanding and understand that there's a relationship to this, being committed to the will of God and having spiritual understanding. It's just as simple. If the will of God doesn't interest me, if I'm not thinking about obeying Him, doing His purposes, being part of His plan, if the will of God is not of interest to you, you will not have spiritual perspective. You will have that point of view from God's perspective. But if we're going to live a life that is going to have true joy in it, that is going to be praiseworthy, pleasing to God of substance, here's the problem. So many people are doing things that has no significance whatsoever. It is simply a survival. As believers in Messiah, we're not about surviving. We're not just about another day and another day, and as long as I can put off death, I'm happy. That's ridiculous. No, we are about a different mindset entirely. We want to live a life of significance, of meaning. We don't want to labor for those things that are here today and gone tomorrow or gone next week or gone next month or whenever it may be. We want to have an eternal significance. And a life that is eternally significant is going to be a kingdom life. So if you're not interested in the will of God, the kingdom of God, you're not going to have that perspective. So Paul says, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, look now to verse 10. He says that you should walk worthy of the Savior. No, that you walk worthy of and the term that's used here in referring to Yeshua, that is, Jesus is Lord. And that's where it begins. When we understand not just that he's my Savior, he is that. He is my Savior. He is my God. He is a, a leader of my life. He's the Lord. That's what's being emphasized. That you walk worthy of the Lord. And in all things that are pleasing and in every, notice this, every good work. Now, here's the problem. In the next several weeks, I'm going to be referring to a wrong perspective. And here's what's happening today. People are teaching and they, they talk about living a just life, a moral life, a life of, of goodness. But here's the problem. They don't define. In fact, I was listening to one very well-known Bible teacher, very popular, has one of the largest congregations. And here's the problem. He was talking about the United States and the laws of the United States. And I agree with much of what he said, that if we base upon, if we base our life upon the law, now we're careful. Because we're not talking about biblical laws, the laws that come from God. He was referring to man's laws. And when we base our life upon the laws of man, we're going to shoot for the low level. We're just going to do the minimum. We're going to push things according to what we want. If we want to get someplace fast, if the speed limit is 100 kilometers an hour, we're going to go 105, 110, pushing it. As long as we're not going to get punished, we'll go even past it a little bit. But we need to realize something. Those laws are not the laws of Scripture. No, the commandments of God. See, if we just do what we think is moral, what we think is right, what does the Scripture say? When someone does what is right in their eyes. Now hear this. They're trying to do what is right, but from their own perspective. It will be, look at the book of Judges. In the book of Judges, it says, 
the children of Israel did what was right. The word here is yeshar in Hebrew. What's that? Straight, upright. They were trying to do what is morally, what is ethical, what is proper, what is good. But it was left to their own vantage point. And what did God say? God said it was evil in his eyes. So if we're going to do that which is moral, that which is ethical, that which is good, we have to know what the scripture says. Because my, in the flesh, naturally, even as a believer, if I just scratch my, my chin and say, oh, I think this is good, I think this is right, I think this is moral, I will be deceived by the enemy. No, I have to base all of my thoughts to what? to the obedience of Messiah. How do I do that? Through the word, to scriptural revelation, to the truth of God. I can't leave it to myself. And that's why, look at it, what it says here. He says uh, that you walk, this term walked in, in verse 10 is a behavior word. It is a word of a lifestyle. So he says that you should walk, he's talking about behavior, your lifestyle, that you should walk in a way that's worthy to the Lord in all things that are pleasing, pleasing to him, pleasing to him. And that's so important that we learn something. If we think, and I've given this example to, to many people, and that is my wife. If I try to be pleasing and buy her something for her birthday or anniversary, whatever it might be, if I just buy her what I think that she might like, <laughs> it's not going to be pleasing to her. Because her thoughts and my thoughts are, are very different. So it's only when I listen to her. Same thing with God. We need to listen. How do we listen? Well, prayerfully, but, but prayerfully reading the Word of God. Because this scripture says that you have a walk worthy of, to his lordship, and to that which is pleasing, and notice what it says, in every good work. And remember, I've said this so, so often. The word good is always, when it's in the Bible, it is attached to God's will. And how do I know God's will? Through the things that he commands. And it's all rooted in love. If we love him, we'll obey. Obey what? His instructions, his words, his commands, and the commandments of God are derived from a concept that speaks about unity, togetherness. So my motivation for obeying God is that it brings me into greater unity. It brings us together in a more powerful and a more experiential way. So Paul writes here, in every good work producing fruit and increasing in the knowledge of God. Now, notice how the scripture unfolds. He's speaking about knowledge, the knowledge of God. Do you want to know the knowledge of God? Do you want to be able to, to understand that which is knowledgeable from God's perspective? Notice the connection here. He says, increasing, and that means forever on. Increasing, 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 growing abundant in the knowledge of God. But then look at what he says in verse 11. And in all power, being empowered. Now, notice the relationship. It is only when I am a recipient of the knowledge of God is God going to entrust to me power. It says here, and in power, being empowered. So it's through his power that we're empowered and it only comes after us growing in the knowledge of God, in his will, in what is pleasing to him, into what he says is worthy for your behavior, your lifestyle, the things of your life. So all of this portrays a call upon us of submissiveness to his truth. It's only when we embrace his truth are we going to be given knowledge? And it's only after receiving knowledge are we going to be entrusted with power. So he says here, in all power, being empowered according to the, and it's another word for power, but it's a different word. The first one is dunamis, 
where we get the English word, and you've heard many people say this, dynamite. It is an explosive power. It can destroy the stronghold of the enemy. But the second word here is the word kratos. Kratos is a creative power. So we see what God is revealing to us. Sometimes we have to destroy in order for us to build up for the creative purposes of God to be, to be achieved. And that when we use that power, that strength, that anointing, however you want to, to understand this, when we use it to build the things of God, notice what it's going to bring about, the power of His glory with all patience and with long suffering with joy there's that word with joy now i hope you see that there's a process that's being revealed here for spiritual growth here's something very important all too often people stand up like i'm standing up in some uh, house of worship at some conference some seminar they write a book whatever and they give you principles and all too often these principles are derived from what they have experienced what they think is right what they think is true they might have and i'm sure they do the best intention intentions but here's the problem biblical principles must derive from the bible and and we just can't have this list the principles and we kind of just uh re restructure them recirculate them reorder them message after message that's not biblical preaching now it might sound good it might speak to our rational mind we'll talk more about speaking to the rational mind when we get into the second half of chapter two of this epistle but here's the problem we need to follow a scriptural revelation in order that we might see how certain principles are united linked together for the desired outcome what desired outcome the will of god being accomplished and he says here when when you understand the will of god and you are a recipient of the power of god and when you're building up the purposes of god there is going to be the manifestation of his glory and when you are part of that you know what it's going to give you a a desire to do that more and more and again and again always in your life and that's why we're going to be and he uses these two words he says here that you are going to be patient and you're going to be long suffering because you understand this is worth it here's the biblical truth when something is a value to you that's really satisfying what's going to happen you're going to be committed to it and if it costs you you're going to be willing to pay it if it involves effort time energy whatever type of resources or such because it's a value you're going to persevere you're going to continue on until the outcome and he's saying here when you are committed to the things of god when you see your life being used to manifest his glory it is addictive you are going to want to continue even if it means that it takes a while to do it even if it means that you're going to suffer in the midst of it because you know in the outcome you're going to have a unique joy one that you can't get see people today they're seeking that joy through uh, alcohol through drugs through uh, consumption of 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 products and such through uh, sexual activity, through a whole bunch of things that leaves in the end that person frustrated, empty, empty. They get their fix and it just evaporates so soon thereafter. And instead of having that, that peace that passes all understanding, instead of having that joy that strengthens us for the next round of service for God, these people become discouraged. And if they keep pursuing these empty, false, counterfeit lies from the enemy, it will bring destruction in their life instead of what Messiah wants us to have and that life of abundance. What does the scripture say? I've come that you might have life and have it abundantly. And that word abundantly means ever increasing. Now, don't just think ever increasing in, in my possessions. No, 
and what we're talking about. Look at the end of verse 11. It says that you're going to have patience and you're going to suffer long with, in the midst of that, you're going to have joy. And what is it going to cause you to do? Look at verse 12. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us. Now, all of this comes from, and he goes back to what we saw last week. And that is, it's a, a reference to redemption. See, I'm joyful. I'm committed. I'm willing to suffer long in order to be used by God because God has done something. He has qualified. I have been qualified, made qualified for his kingdom to be in a relationship with him. That he is willing to share all things. How do I know all things? Because the word of God says something. In Romans chapter 8, we read, If he did not withhold his only begotten son, but that he sent him to this world to die in our behalf, it says, Will he not also freely give to you all things with him? So I can be assured God's not stingy. God's not going to hold back anything. If he was willing to provide me his only begotten son, begotten and beloved, realize something. He is willing to also share with him all things. So we read giving thanks to the one who has qualified us for a portion in the inheritance of, and notice what it says, in the inheritance of the saints. Now, he goes back to something we talked about last week, and that is that inheritance, that portion, that kingdom inheritance that we're going to have through the grace of God, through grace working itself out through faithfulness, that is through obedience in our life, and that is a proper behavior. And again, I can only behave properly when I understand the truth of God, that I have received revelation to that which is pleasing to God. Look now to, to the end of verse, verse 12. He says, this inheritance of the saints, and then he ends this verse by saying, in light. Now that's odd. What do you think he means, in light? Well, realize if you're a good student of prophecy, you're going to realize that light in the kingdom of God goes together. Just read sometime Zechariah chapter 14, and we see that. There is a uniqueness of the kingdom of God and this concept of light. So when he says that we're going to be recipients of this inheritance of the saints, that portion that we have earned through living that praiseworthy life, pursuing a behavior that's pleasing to God, we're going to inherit with the saints in light, that is, in the kingdom. Who, and now he's going to be talking about how he's qualified us, how he has made us fit for the kingdom of God. He says that he has delivered us from the authority. And pay attention to that word. It can be authority or power. And it's not either or, but in actuality, it's both. It's a combination. This word, this Greek word, exousia, authority and power. So we have this hope. We have this, this promise from God, and if we submit to His truth, His revelation, we're going to have a wonderful inheritance in the kingdom of God. It is going to be manifested, illuminated, this wonderful inheritance that we're going to share with other saints, our brethren, brothers and sisters in Messiah. And this one, Messiah Yeshua, who has delivered us from the authority or the power of darkness. And that's where most people are, in darkness. They can't see kingdom light. They don't have a kingdom perspective. And therefore, they're pursuing the things of this world, which can never ultimately satisfy. So he has, through redemption, delivered us from the power and the authority of darkness and transfer, transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son in whom the redemption we have redemption through his blood and what is that that redemption through his blood 
the forgiveness of sins. Now, for me, that verse, verse 13, is so significant because it wraps up everything that I need to know that motivates me, changes me, in order that I might, might be pleasing to God. And when you're pleased, pleasing to God, you're going to be pleased with your life. You're going to have a sense of supernatural satisfaction. So look at that again. Speaking about Messiah, verse 13, who has delivered us. We didn't do it. We didn't participate. He did it in our behalf. It says, who delivered us from the authority and the power of darkness and has transferred us into, this is our new home. This is our new, new committed uh, 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 hope transferred us into the, the kingdom of his beloved son in whom, verse 14, in whom we have redemption through his blood. And what does that redemption do? It gives us the forgiveness of sins. And this is a promise from God that gives me, don't miss it, it gives me assurance. Now, Paul, over and over, he reveals so much truth, wanting to mature us, transform us, and give us insight. But he keeps coming back to this wonderful message. Because we can never lose sight that by the blood of Messiah, we have been delivered from darkness into a kingdom of his marvelous light. That we might see things differently for the purpose of, of behaving in a way that we're going to have a wonderful inheritance. But realize this, it all begins with redemption, that is, the forgiveness of sins. So if you don't have your sins forgiven, you need to accept the blood of Messiah. Right now, saying, God, I'm sorry for my sins, and I'm trusting in that shed blood of your only begotten Son, that I might experience eternal redemption. Well, I'll close with that. Until next week.